Barcelona, under the leadership of Guardiola in 2010-2011, enchanted the world and is considered by many as one of the greatest football teams in history. It's clear that a team like that, which achieved great results on the field by playing attractive football, would strongly influence football trends in the following years. And that's exactly what happened. Guardiola employs a tactical concept called positional play, heavily influenced by the Netherlands in 1974 and with Johan Cruyff as one of its main precursors. A significant portion of coaches worldwide uses this logic to tactically organize the team based on structured and pre-established formations. In addition to Guardiola, mentioned in this video, coaches like Xavi, De Zarbi, Tuchel, Arteta, among others, follow a more positional approach. If you take a look at the previous videos on this channel, you will see that the tactical explanations also largely adhere to this positional logic. A positional approach greatly helps players orient themselves on the field, knowing the team's tactical setup and the positioning of their teammates, as well as how they will move. It's an idea that conserves a lot of the player's energy in making decisions during the match. But this way of perceiving football has become strongly linked to European football. However, in recent years, especially in South America, a tactical idea challenging positional play has emerged, based on a different logic, previously known as functional play and more recently as relationism. In Brazil, there was a certain controversy lingering about the practical existence and the choice of the term, functional, as well as the question of whether the dichotomy between positional and functional truly made sense. Regarding the practical existence of this playing style, it's clear that the way coaches like Fernando Diniz and Renato Portaluppi think about their teams is quite different from what we traditionally considered normal. Take a look at this frame in the semi-final match of the 2020 Copa do Brasil between Grêmio, led by Renato Portaluppi, and Sao Paulo, coached by Fernando Diniz at the time. If you pause the video and count how many players are on the screen, you will see that all 20 outfield players are there. You can pause and count. Notice that the rightmost player is Juan Fran, Sao Paulo's right back at the time, positioned roughly at the halfway line of the field. In other words, all 20 outfield players are on the left side of Sao Paulo's attack, and no one is on the right side. This may seem strange, but it makes sense within the logic of relationism. By the way, going back to the discussion of the term, perhaps the word, relationism, as recently coined by Scottish coach Jamie Hamilton, encapsulates this idea well. While positional play focuses on the team's setup in each phase of the game, relationism emphasizes the intuitive ability of the team's players to interact with each other. Relationism, in theory, seeks to emphasize players' technical qualities and their ability to improvise. Pay attention to the phrase, emphasize. I don't mean to say that positional play doesn't allow for players' creativity. In a positional approach, there's room to devise strategies to isolate a skillful player for a one-on-one -on -one dribble, for example. Afterward, I recommend watching our video about the box in the midfield. That's a positional logic and can be used to favor skillful players in individual plays, but using tactical formations to make it happen. In a relationism approach, the tactical setup takes a back seat. Imbalance is created by players' proximity, quick passing, and changes in the ball's direction, which can cause confusion in the defense and open up spaces. And what spaces will be opened? You can't always be sure, which is why attacking players need the freedom to quickly read the play and exploit any available space. That's why, in relationism, highly refined technical skills in tight spaces and the ability to make rapid decisions are not just desirable, they are necessary. This is because, in this style of play, a large number of players often congregate in a small space, which demands technical precision to control the ball close to their feet and make quick decisions. In addition to the coaches mentioned earlier, such as Fernando Diniz and Renato Portaluppi, other coaches like Doraville Jr. from Sao Paulo, Eduardo Codet from Internacional, and even Ancelotti from Real Madrid, can be considered to have a similar approach. This idea is highly adaptable to South American football culture, especially in Brazil, for two main reasons. The first is street football, which, despite becoming less common, is still popular in Brazil, for example. Many Brazilian children grow up playing football in often short and improvised spaces and on uneven terrain, such as streets, sidewalks, and dirt, developing the ability to improvise and respond quickly to the obstacles the playing field presents, like tree stumps, curbs, etc. In fact, one of the great admirers of street football was Cruyff himself, one of the most prominent figures in positional play, who often created training exercises trying to simulate street games. The Rondo itself, 
which is common in training and warm-ups at top clubs, is a version of the keep-away game, also called square in other places. A second reason, this time more formal, is the popularity of another sport in South America, futsal. Futsal is a sport invented in Uruguay, very similar to football but played on a smaller court. Each futsal team has one goalkeeper and four outfield players on a court that can be up to 40 meters long by 20 meters wide, with many courts being even smaller than that in some places. For comparison, the player density on a football field is about 375 square meters per player. In an official futsal court, this density is 80 square meters. In other words, in futsal, the playing space is much smaller, and, consequently, players are always close to the ball and actively participating in the game. This demands from them the ability to play in tight spaces, controlling and manipulating the ball close to their feet and making quick, often intuitive decisions. Many high-level and globally renowned players today had early exposure to futsal. Players like Neymar, Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, Philippe Cochino, Vinicius Jr., Gabriel Martinelli, Antony, and even Messi are examples of South American players who played futsal from a young age. It's also worth noting that futsal is popular in some European countries, like Portugal, Spain, and Russia, and players like Xavi, Iniesta, and Cristiano Ronaldo also played futsal. The sources about these players having experience in futsal are in the description. All of this is to provide context that players with this profile strongly favor relationism. As mentioned earlier, the most obvious aspect of relationism is players crowding around the ball, enabling short passing and creating a numerical advantage for the team in possession. One point to emphasize is that, as players are in close proximity and pass quickly, the ball movements are always short, and changes in the ball's direction are constant. This often catches defenders off guard when they can't intercept the ball or make a tackle. On the other hand, the pressure on the ball area increases inevitably, requiring players, as mentioned, to have a high capacity to control the ball in tight spaces and make quick decisions. However, the clustering of players for quick and short passing is seen as an advantage in relationism, with teams often preferring to build up the play on the busier side rather than the emptier side. But, of course, not everything in relationism is pure chaos. This approach has key principles that guide players' decision-making. Combinations involving two, three, or even more players are also extensively practiced to create and exploit spaces in the opponent's defense. A basic combination commonly used is a simple one-two pass, with one player passing the ball and running behind the defender. However, more complex combinations can naturally arise, as long as they adhere to the principles of relationism. For example, imagine a simple combination with three players, each marked individually. The player with the ball passes it to a teammate and advances without the ball. The receiving player passes to the third player, who quickly lays it off to the player who initiated the passing sequence and is advancing. In this scenario, the passes are rapid, and the two advanced players receive the ball and naturally attract their markers. However, their time on the ball is so brief that the markers cannot apply pressure in time, and the ball quickly returns to the first player while these two markers are caught out of position giving an advantage to the player receiving the ball in stride. Of course, this combination doesn't have to be exclusively within a relationism logic, but it contains elements characteristic of this idea. In this imaginary example we just showed, we can also see another extremely important point. The player who passes the ball making an overlapping run. It's the famous, toka e pasa, or, toko we mi voi, I pass and go concept. Depending on the role a player has within the collective system of the team, of course, a centre-back wouldn't have as much freedom to do this constantly. This role is crucial for the team's progression. Passing the ball to a teammate and attacking a vacant space. But, despite combinations being a powerful weapon in relationism, players can also choose to try to unsettle the defence through dribbling, provided they judge the situation is suitable. And, of course, playing in a congested area constantly, it's natural that some ball losses may occur, but the post-loss pressure is another important aspect of relationism. As teams using this approach often attack in numbers, they can quickly establish a pressing zone near the ball loss area to attempt an immediate recovery, preventing the counterattack. There are also some texts from an anonymous writer known by the pseudonym Joseph Bozschik, who apparently coined the term, functional attack. If you want, you can research his work to delve deeper into the topic. I'll stop here, and I recommend you also watch our video about creating spaces. It's appearing on the screen, click and watch it now.